All right, good to be with you and thankful for your presence today. Uh, we're going to start in John the 10th chapter, so we invite you to turn there, John 10. Uh, the setting here is wintertime, the Feast of Dedication, I guess what we'd call December. And um, the Lord is teaching, and his teaching was controversial with some people. His teaching still is controversial, but it's also still true. And so the Jews wanted to know, you know, who are you? Just tell us plainly. He had told them plainly. He had told them plainly over and again. They just didn't hear it. And that's what he said. He said, I told you, verse 25, and uh, you believe not. If you don't believe me, you ought to believe at least the works. Uh, he uh, went on to say, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. Notice the pronoun. I give to them eternal life. Um, he said uh, in verse 26, they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Whose hand are they in? My hand, he said. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of thy Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And that statement uh, greatly angered the Jews. And so uh, we pick up uh, the story there in verse uh, 33. Uh, the Jews took up stones. I ought to read verse 31. The Jews took up stones to stone him. And Jesus said, well, which one of the good works that I've done do you stone me for? And he said, well, it's not for good works. He said, because you've, you've blasphemed. You've made yourself equal with God. And that's when Jesus said to them, he said, is it not written in your law? I said, you're God's. Now let me pause there and notice over quickly in, in the book of Psalms, in the, in the 82nd Psalm, there's a Psalm that Jesus refers to here where the Lord speaks, the Psalm of Asaph, God standing in the congregation of the mighty and he judges among the gods. How long will ye uh, judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy and rid them out of the hand of the wicked. He's talking here about what he calls the gods. Now, they're the judges, obviously. People who have power to be able to decide yes or no and to affect people's lives. And he said, what you ought to be doing is defending the poor. But he calls them Elohim, mighty ones. Now, back over in our text in John, Jesus said, you don't have any problem with Asaph calling the judges mighty ones? But you think I exalt myself too high? I who have done all of these miracles and wonders? If he call them, he says, gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, I blaspheme because I said I am the Son of God. We're not so much concentrating today on the, the psalm or on John 10, really. I really want to just notice this one expression uh, we find here in verse 35. Jesus said the scripture cannot be broken. You accuse me of doing something the scripture allows me to do. And the scripture cannot be broken. The word scripture is an interesting word. The word is in the original is graphe. That comes over into English. We talk about um, graphite, which is the material we make pencil lead from, I think. Uh, something to write with. A graphic artist, somebody who does lettering, among other things. So here's graphic in the idea of writing. And that's what the word means in the original, but it means more than that. It's not just writing, but it, it has to do with inspired writing. I think the word is used 51 times in the New Testament, and every time it's used, it's related back to that which is sacred writing or what claims to be. Now that's important because you have to recognize the fact 
that when you read this word scripture or graphe in the, in the Bible, you're not talking about just me writing a postcard to somebody. You're talking about that which claims to be from God. One fellow put it this way. He said, what's stated in this verse from the Psalms is true because it belongs, this verse belongs to a body of writings known as Scripture. And the Scripture possesses authority so absolute in character that it cannot be broken. When Christ here employs the word Scripture, he has in mind not a particular verse of the Psalms, but rather the entire group of writings of which this one verse is a part. Jesus said, this comes from the Scripture, and the Scripture cannot be broken. The word luo, it almost sounds like the word loose, and that's really what the word literally means. To loosen, to undo something. It's a word that John uses over and again. He uses it of the destruction of the temple. It's a strong word. He uses it of the breaking of the Sabbath, and he uses it of the violation of the law, or the destruction of Satan's works. And here he uses it in reference to the Scripture and says you can't break the Scripture. Or as one modern speech translation put it, you can't argue with the Scriptures. Well, there are a lot of folks that try. And I think through the years we've seen the Scriptures under attack by different people. Uh, if you can read this headline, I'm sure you can't read the article. But the headline here in the paper several years ago said, Scholars discount 80% of what Jesus said. Uh, that, it, that is, that he said it. There was something, some of you guys may remember this from years ago, called the Jesus Seminar, where a group of unbelieving scholars got together, Bible scholars, and uh, they would sit down and decide, well, now, here's what uh, we read here in Matthew or Mark or Luke or John. You think Jesus said that? How many of you think Jesus said this? Oh, I don't think he said that. Okay, well, let's strike that. <laughs> and so they just went through the Scriptures and, uh, and, and struck out a great many things that, uh, that we find there. Scholars. Um, Time Magazine a few years ago ran a cover story. The Bible, is it fact or fiction? I'll let you guess what they decided. But there are plenty of people who have through the years attacked the Word of God. Nothing new about that. Didn't surprise the Lord. <clears throat> what did Jesus teach us in the parable of the sower? The seed is the Word of God and those by the wayside are they that hear but their heart is, is hardened and the devil comes along and takes away the word out of their hearts that they should believe and be saved. Now hear me on this point. Let me tell you, there are a lot of slanderous things said about the word of God. And if you want to believe them, if you're looking for an excuse to do away with the Bible, and there are plenty of people who are, you'll find an excuse. If the Bible is too strict for you, you don't like what it says, you, you can get on the internet and in five minutes you can have somebody who knows next to nothing tell you some argument that sounds good on the surface and that's good enough for me and just close this book up and be done with it. But if you're serious about your soul and if you think about things in a more serious way, then that's not going to be the way you approach it. A question that's often asked is, can we trust our Bibles? This lesson comes from, I think I mentioned ahead of time what I was going to try to talk about today. This lesson comes from uh, a question. I think it's a good question, an honest question. Uh, because we hear this so often. And it relates to this. Can we trust the text of the Bible as being authentic to what the apostles wrote? How do you know that the Bible that you have today in 2022 is the same thing that Paul wrote in the first century? That's been a long time. How do you know all kinds of things weren't added along the long as we uh, go through history? And I would add a second question that I hope to deal with maybe tonight. And that is... Uh, if we do prove that what we have goes back to the apostles, why should I listen to them? And why should we trust the Bible at all as our guide? That's a lot to cover in a few minutes. We're going to do the best we can to try to get that done today. Let me start off with the first question. 
and the great gap. You know what we're talking about here. It's a common idea. I believe it's a great misconception. But people wonder how is it possible for me in these days to trust what I'm reading here was really what they wrote in the first century. It comes out in different ways. Sometimes people ask questions like this. If you don't have the originals, as far as I know, we don't have any of the autographed copies. If you don't have the originals, then how can you be sure that we have the Word of God? Well, one point that I might make just in passing is, you know, when Jesus quoted from the 82nd Psalm, he wasn't reading from the paper that David wrote on. And so it must be possible to trust copies of the Scriptures, at least the Lord teaches it was. Well, somebody else says, we believe the Bible as it is correctly translated. We're going to touch on translations today. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I would just make this point. That sometimes people say, well, unless you know the original Greek and Hebrew, then, then uh, you just can't know the Scriptures. You can't trust a translation. Things always get lost in translation. You may be aware of this. You know when the New Testament writers quote the Old Testament that oftentimes they refer to the Greek Old Testament, which is a translation of the Old Testament? So apparently it is possible to read a translation. Not every translation is good, but it's possible to find a translation that reflects the Word of God. And somebody else would say, there's been so much time that's elapsed. How do you know? That's the central core of what we're looking at this morning. It's a little bit like that old game that kids used to play. I don't know if they play it anymore or not. They used to call it telephone or gossip or something like that. Some of you guys may never have heard of it. But the idea is that you have uh, kids lined up, you know, and then they'll whisper in the ear of their partner. You'll start off with something. You'll give a kid a little small sentence or a word or two, and then he'll whisper it in the ear of the next one, the next one, the next one. And the idea is by the time it goes through a number of kids, well, it might start out Mary had two white cats and it winds up Mary had two black dogs. You see, that's just the way it goes. It's just lost in, in, the, in the transmission of the thing and that's the way the New Testament is. It's just lost that way. I think it's interesting, again, Jesus had such confidence in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament was uh, written 1,400 years before the time of Christ. But he had no problem referring to Deuteronomy <laughs> He could tell the devil, you know, the Lord said man shall not live by bread alone. Well, he did, but he said that 1,400 years before the Lord came. The point is that uh, we're not just lost out here without any evidence that we have a way of verifying the things that we know and believe. Uh, if you talk to someone about textual criticism and, you know, the formal study of what we're talking about here. They will often make the point that there are three great witnesses that uh, verify the, the truthfulness of our text. Uh, and this goes back to what they would call the patristics, the versions, and the manuscripts. Those are the terms that you hear a great deal. And we're going to explain about what we mean by those things. But I would just say this. To me, Maybe the most important witness is a fourth witness that we're going to talk about at the end of our study on this today. Uh, and we'll bring that up then. But when you talk about the patristics, the versions of the manuscripts, what are you talking about? What does the term patristic mean? Well, I'll admit to you, I don't like that word. Uh, patristic, pater, father. It has to do with what is oftentimes referred to the people as church fathers. You know, I don't know what all these guys believed. I don't know what all their relationships were with God. But, but the term is used to describe especially the anti-Nicene fathers. Um, you know, you may have seen copies of this. It's a nine or ten volume set. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's the writings, collected writings, translated into our language, of men who claimed to be Christians and who wrote about Christianity in the years between... A.D. 100 and A.D. 325. There was a big council at Nicaea up in Upper Asia Minor in 325, a religious council called by Constantine the emperor. 
And so that's sort of an important date in, in religious history and all the things that happened before that. The writings that are collected before that uh, that we have are here in this collection of anti-Nicene fathers. What it does, it gives us a little insight into what people believe back then. It's not authoritative. It doesn't mean that these fellows were inspired. They were not. But they wrote all those years ago. That takes us back a long way, prior to 325. And when you look at what they wrote, uh, it, it's pretty impressive. Um, one thing that they, this is uh, from a fellow named Clement, uh, Clement may have been mentioned in Philippians. It may be the same fellow that uh, was mentioned in Philippians 4.3, I think it is. And uh, we have some of his writings. Now, again, these are not inspired works, but they're works written from a fellow a long time ago. And um, in one letter he wrote, he wrote about the apostles, he said, they have preached the gospel to us from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has... Uh, has come from God. Christ therefore sent forth by God and the apostles by Christ. He talks about how that if you're going to believe Christ, you're going to have to believe those that Christ sent. Um, and he also writes, uh, take up the epistle of the blessed apostle Paul what did he write to you at the time when the gospel first began to be preached? Truly, under the inspiration of the Spirit, he wrote to you concerning himself and Cephas and Apollos, because even then parties had formed among you. I'm not asking you to answer out. Anybody here guess what he's talking about there? First Corinthians chapter one. What did Paul write? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and uh, in verse uh, 10, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. There be no divisions among you. You be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. It has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them of the house of Chloe. There are contentions among you. And this I say, every one of you says, I am a Paul. I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. So Clement writes a letter over to Corinth, and he said, do you remember what the beloved apostle Paul wrote to you? Now he said he wrote by inspiration about the divisions among you. So apparently here's Clement writing around the year 200, who was well aware of 1 Corinthians. In fact, later on, a little bit later on, he writes, love covers a multitude of sins, Love bears all things and is long-suffering in all things. 1 Corinthians 13, love covers a multitude of sins. That's quoted in James, or that's a quote from James. So here's the point, that here were people who lived around the year 200 up to the year 325. These people uh, saw an authoritative canon we're going to use that term canon. We'll talk about it a little more later. Canon is a, is a word from the Greek kanon, which means like a ruler. It's not canon like an like a, a ordinance, but it's, it's one end. It's canon as a sense of a measuring stick. And, and when they talk about the canon, what they mean is here are the books that measure up to the standard of what's inspired. You know, there were a lot of books that were written, and that's a great study, too, and we're not going to deal much with that. The lost books of the Bible. What you figure out when you go through all the layers and get to the bottom is those books weren't lost. They were rejected. There are a lot of teachings that are put forward that just don't measure up. And so they're not inspired of God. But it was recognized there was an inspired canon. And when you read these fellows who lived back before the year 325, they wrote about the epistles and they wrote about the book of Acts. Here's another fellow, Tertullian. In his work against Marcion, he points to the book of Acts as being authoritative and adds, we shall draw our evidence from the epistles of Paul himself. I don't know what I was thinking. I talked about 
uh, Clement living around 200. I was thinking about Tertullian. Uh, Clement, we mentioned, probably mentioned in Philippians, lived in the late first century and mid first century. So that goes back probably the earliest. But Tertullian comes along about 100 years later and uh, he's writing about the book of Acts. If you've got a problem with this, you need to look here. He's writing against a fellow named Marcion who was a heretic who had all kinds of strange ideas about God being not the same God as the God of the Old Testament and all kinds of things like that. Don't want to get into his false teaching, but the point is when Tertullian was taking him to task, he said, you need to read the book of Acts. I believe I know where that book is. In another work called Against Heretics, he wrote this interesting passage, Tertullian did. He said, come now, you who would indulge a better curiosity. If you would apply it to the business of your salvation, run over the apostolic churches in which their own authentic writings are read, uttering the voice and representing the face of each of them severally. You can still learn what the apostles taught. That ought to be what matters to you, not what somebody comes up with. And he said you can learn that from their writings. He said you can go to the apostolic churches. I, I think that means the churches that the apostles founded. And what's interesting to me is he says, their own authentic writings. I don't know. We talked about the autographs a while ago. What happened to the autographs? I suppose they wore out. Maybe they were lost. Maybe they were destroyed on purpose by some enemy. I don't know. Maybe there's some of them still around waiting to be found. But I do find it interesting that at least 100 years later, you know, Tertullian was writing about their own authentic writings. That seems to be a reference to the autographs that were still available at least in his day. When you read these fellows, it's interesting how many times they refer to the Scriptures, that is, to the New Testament. Clement, we mentioned a while ago, wrote about 1 Corinthians, or referred to, or quoted from, Acts, Titus, Matthew, Luke, Hebrews, all of these different books. Uh, and, and you could just go on and make a long list there. Methetus, uh, word, his name means disciple. He's called the disciple, Methetus. And he wrote uh, a few years later uh, and quoted from Galatians and 2 Corinthians and John. And uh, Ignatius did the same thing. And Justin the Martyr, a famous fellow from early religious history uh, who uh, wrote a famous work to the emperor of Rome uh, explaining Christianity as he understood it. But he would quote from Matthew and Luke and 1 uh, Corinthians and so on. Uh, in fact, somebody made the point that you could just about reconstruct the New Testament from the writings, uh, the quotations that are found in the Anadocene Fathers. I've never tried to do that. I don't know. But I know they are referred to widely. And there are two things significant about that. Uh, in particular, this. There are people, critics, who will say that modern Christianity was formed by some Roman emperor who came along uh, like uh, Constantine, uh, when he accepted Christianity, quote unquote, and he imposed all his ideas, I've heard people say that's where the New Testament came from. Constantine made up the books, or at least he decided which ones would fit in the Bible. All those are just ridiculous lies. But they're, they're non historical, they're inaccurate. What I find in reading the Anti Nicene Fathers is that they uh, had an idea of the core of the canon before the Romans ever had such influence uh, on uh, anything called Christianity. So the point in our lesson this morning is this. You can go back to the, the years before 325 and you can find the presence of and respect for the books of the Bible. People say, well, what about the great gap? It doesn't leave much of a gap when you go back that far, does it? Uh, the translations also come into play here. Boy, and my time is up and I've just scratched the surface here. But, the, you know, sometimes I try to preach this in one lesson. Uh, that's, that's a fun night. Uh, I'm talking mighty fast, and, but uh, anyway. But I, I do want to make this point. I realize this lesson is difficult to preach in more than one lesson because it can leave it rather disjointed in where we stop. 
But what I'm trying to do with is this question. I hope we don't forget and lose sight of our goal. Is there a great gap between our Bible, the Bible that we have today, and uh, the time of the apostles? We brought up the patristics to suggest that that's not the case, that you can read the scripture that you and I have referred to in 100, in 200, in 300. And so that takes us back all the way to the very doorstep of the, uh, of the time of the first century. I think I can make the same case in reference to the translations, uh, the versions of the Bible that we have. And um, I'm just going to have to, to stop here and we'll talk about this section tonight uh, and see how far we get. But I do appreciate your patience and I appreciate your kind attention uh, this morning. Um, I believe what we're talking about is important because before I suppose we can uh, really have a lot of success in helping people to appreciate the greatness of God, we have to get them interested in reading the Word of God and to try to dis dis uh, ban some of these lies that are told about the Word of God. And I hope that maybe this effort will be of help to you in doing that. If you're here this morning and you've not responded to the gospel of Christ, and we hope that this morning you'll do that, that you will come and say, I want to be a Christian. I want to be a child of God. And we would encourage you to uh, be baptized into Christ today if you believe, if you are penitent, if you are willing to confess your faith in Christ. If you're here as one who as a child of God has not been faithful to the Lord that loves you, then why not today uh, repent, return to him, and make that right with him. And we'd be glad to help you. Even now as we stand and sing, will you come? Uh...